is my distinct honor to introduce the next panel. The commitment of this distinguished panel has also been unwavering. They are true game changers that have set the stage for the next 50 years and beyond. Please help me welcome Louise Radnofsky with the Wall Street Journal. This is a really great panel for me to be able to interview. Um, hopefully I can ask some of the questions that you guys might have as well, um, but a really great opportunity to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are with Title IX and what the next 50 years will look like. So I'm, I'm excited. I wanted to uh, start by asking Carissa and Sheila and Ariel a little bit about um, when they first encountered Title IX. This is the bit where we look backwards, right before we look forward. And um, I think I'm gonna do this in chronological order. Sheila, can you tell me when you first encountered Title IX? Well, first of all, I want everyone to understand I'm the oldest person up here. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, I was always, I, I never was part of Title IX because it was way back in the 60s in the 70s, I was always a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader in elementary school, uh, junior high, high school, and then at the University of Illinois. So when I graduated from Illinois in 70, Title IX started in 72. And I do remember the day that it was announced and when it all happened, and I just thought, this is really terrific. I mean, we're now gonna be on an equal playing field with the men. Well, it was very controversial, and if you really go back and do a little bit of investigation, it created a lot of problems with a lot of fathers who had their boys, uh, their young men, they had real plans for them to get into pro sports and everything. But what was happening, it was taking money from all of those other programs that were in the schools. So uh, it was a little bit of an uproar, and I do remember it as clear as if it was yesterday, and how we always had to deal with these issues. And there were fights that broke out in the high school, not fights, but arguments among families, you know. And so then the money had to be redistributed through other programs. So I think it's, it's kind of worked its way out, but there's still some issues that Title IX needs to be re-examined. We will get right to those issues, but Carissa, I think if I understood this right, you were six when Title IX passed, so did you see the differences uh, for you? Do you have a sense of what might have been? Yeah, a little bit, I'm second oldest, so I'm 56, so I was six when um, Title IX was passed, and I don't know that I encountered it really until sport kind of started to get serious I had opportunities in high school, but there was the girls' gym that was old and creaky and the boys' gym that was new. We were just happy to play. Um, and then I was privileged to be able to play a Division I sport on scholarship in college, uh, field hockey. And USA Field Hockey's here, my good friends. <laughs> um, but, but we had four women that had scholarship opportunities where the football team at this university that did not do as well as the field hockey team um, had 70, and they had a different travel schedule, and they're on airplanes, and they had dining hours, and then I started to realize, even though we were just so privileged and excited to play, that something wasn't fair. And you, I was a, becoming an adult, going into education, I thought, I need to pay attention to this and use what I'm experiencing and seeing, and the people who are my mentors and role models, I needed to learn from them and then say, now what do I do with that torch? Um, so the years have gone fast, but I agree, there's more to be done. Mm -hmm. And Ariel, everything was solved by the time that you started <laughs> in school, right? Well, I don't know if everything's been solved, um, but I definitely encountered Title IX at my university, at the University of Texas, and I didn't really think about it until I was trying to figure out how we didn't have some sports that competed in D1 and we had to have intramural sports for other teams. And I was just really confused as why we couldn't all just be D1. And then that's when they started to explain to me and I started kind of studying up a little bit on Title IX. And so that's honestly my first encounter with it. And when you studied up on Title IX, were you able to argue uh, using it? Um, it was just more of me researching and being in awe of the fact that we even had to create something like that in the first place. Mm -hmm. Can I also mention something? Uh, once I became owner of the Mystics, oh. and this is now, now, 
there are real problems. The, the facilities were so unequal. When I picked up the mystics, and I remember the day that they were doing the transfer over, and I became part of Monumental Sports, I said, well, where are the mystics' locker rooms? They had no locker room. You didn't know that, did you? I did not. You did not know that. So I was given a storage facility, and with my own money, was able to, to create a real locker room for the Mystics, which is now George, Georgetown uses it. Okay. So fast forward, we now have an event center. But just even taking over the team, and even with the WNBA, there's still unequal facilities that are still going on, and it's still an ongoing problem. And um, I hope I don't get my head handed to me for saying that. But we have got to keep working on this. Just because Title IX is here, there's still a lot of unequal areas that we have got to continue to work on. And we've got to be very cognizant of that. I mean, don't think it's over. And you know, I'm, I'm so proud of my team because we've been able to put the foundation in there and they can stand on the shoulders of the people that started Title IX and have the foundation of Title IX, but they have not, they cannot become complacent because we still have a long way to go. You, speaking of not being complacent, do you think Title IX can survive the next 50 years? If we keep watching it and I think we continue have to the people that are in charge, it's the NCAA, everything, we've got to keep reminding them. And if we see something wrong, it was just like with the NCAA finals and the young lady out in Oregon, when she saw the fitness facilities and she spoke up and it made the news, we have got to keep doing that. And that's what's important. Do not come, become complacent. Speaking up is, is one way of, of doing it. Carissa, do you see other ways where Title IX could strengthened right now? Well, I do. I think um, speaking up, but also educating um, and not looking at it as strictly a women in sport issue. This is about access to education, access to opportunities in any institution receiving federal funds. Um, recent data shows that right now the number of women who matriculate to medical and law schools have actually surpassed men. So th that's good news. But we still have, at the grassroots level, a lot of education that needs to be done, and a lot of the program improvement at that level, so that we grow up learning, we grow up in an environment that already has Title IX taken care of. Um, it, but it's going to be an ongoing journey. It's something that, uh, I use the analogy of passing a torch. We can't put that torch down. Um, I was on the flight in, and the flight attendant was probably my age, maybe younger, um, but of the ilk, and she saw the pin, and she said, what's that nine? What's that Title IX thing? And I thought, wow, um, you're probably close to my age. That, that's alarming. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got to do a better job with the messaging, celebrating, and then digging into where the work lies. Ariel, do you feel like you're teammates or your rivals think a lot about Title IX now? Obviously, you're, you're in a professional sports environment. You're not in education anymore, but you all came up through a system that was shaped by it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we watched the Spirit play here the other day, and the NWSL is a big part of it, and I think the WNBA, too. I think you constantly see us speaking, in, speaking out about inequities when it comes to be it our travel, the facilities. I mean, we're thankful to be a part of an organization that's continuously fighting for the uptick of the WNBA, but you've got other people surrounding the WNBA that don't see it as a necessity. And I think we're constantly putting our foot down and saying this is unacceptable. And how did you end up in basketball? Was that a sport that you just loved and were drawn to? Was that the sport that was available? Well, um, it was the sport that I was best at, for one. Um, I tried <laughs> a lot of different things, and basketball stuck with it. Um, but it's obviously it's one of the most accessible sports. All you need is a ball. Um, and I think that's one of the things when we talk about underprivileged youth and we talk about youth sports, we need to talk about how to make other sports accessible. If you talk about golf, lacrosse, all these sports that need very specific equipment, I never thought about playing any of those sports. 
So it's really just a matter of what was accessible and what I was good at. So. <laughs> I'm really interested in the opportunities that are currently available and the way that Title IX operates, and particularly in high schools, Chris. You, you know, that girls and boys play separately, that that is how we're, we're approaching this idea of equal access. And in some places, they play different sports as well. Um, do you think this works? Do you think there are opportunities for this to change? Do you think this, this could change in time and tackle football, America's sport, could be something that girls are playing? So that's an interesting question about boys and girls separately. Sport is defined by nature, by gender. And you know, in the first part of the panel, there was conversation around the Department of Education, OCR, language around um, discrimination, around gender identity. And we're certainly facing this um, in every state across the country. Our 51 associations, which are the 50 states, and Washington, DC, which has their own association, all really being challenged by how to respond to transgender or non-binary participation. So do I see the future based on gender as mattering? Absolutely, because there's science around biological development. However, when we talk about access to opportunities and we talk about gender participation and, and inclusion, one of the things we like to say is let's talk about the age that we're talking about. If we are a youth-based organization, a scholastic-based organization, then let's talk about 14-year-olds. If we are an elite professional organization, let's talk about 24-year-olds. They're not the same. And then let's talk about the purpose of our activities and why we want these activities to be available for kids. All kids access to something. Um, Let's talk about the broader picture of some of the other data that we're aware of about the growing up experience and the challenges that our, min our minority um, populations face. So it's complicated to say boys are in boys sports, girls are in girls sports, and it's based on gender at birth. And Wait a minute. And let's talk about age and stage. Um, I know working with a number of national governing bodies, I sit on three of their boards of directors, football, basketball, and field hockey. And one of the things that they're challenged with is defining elite talent. Because we have U16s and U18s and these folks representing our country. Yet we also have one state where a 16-year-old cannot play because they're transgender and one that they can. So what happens when you cross a state line? You represent your nation, but you can't represent your high school. So it's really complicated. We are seeing, hopefully, a regrowth in intramural opportunities. I love what Project Play and the Aspen Institute is doing through the playbook and in looking at those eight plays, growing more club opportunities, co-ed opportunities, things that look to engage kids first. Um, and, and I think we'll work it out eventually as the science becomes richer and we really understand what the level of participation is about um, but we, when we talk about youth sports, high school sports, I think it's a, it's a complex discussion. Um, and I do think as long as we increase opportunities, be they co-ed, be they single gender sport, based on a number of things, we can grow sport and continue to have something for everyone. Well, well hitting fast forward a little through the complicated process right now of hitting fairness and inclusion at the same time and, and hoping that people of goodwill can, can chart a path through. Getting to the, the, sort of the fun part afterwards, do you see, and, and Ariel and Sheila in particular, do you see the sports on offer changing in the next 50 years? In your day, Sheila, it was cheerleading. And then all of a sudden there are these other sports available. Do you, do you think that Title IX 50 years from now involves sports that are either operating under different rules in order to allow people of all genders to play together or that just the, the, the sports programming on offer is, is different because kids 50 years from now are gonna be different in what they want? Well, I just wanna talk about something that I see that's changing. There are so many schools that do not have physical education anymore. And so you've got all these club sports that are operating outside the schools. And I think what's happening is then those clubs either become all white and people from underserved communities are not part of this anymore. So you're starting to see a racial gap in sports. And I think this is something that we've got to keep looking at. And I know through monumental sports, we're very cognizant about this huge racial gap that's starting to happen. 
because you go out in the suburbs and there's soccer fields, there's little league and everything, you don't see anybody of color on this. And it's because something is happening in the schools where they can't afford gym. And so the parents are paying good money to then have their kids play in these private clubs. And this is really creating a racial disparity that is going on across this country. And I know with monumental sports, we do reach out in underserved communities. We've got hockey leagues going on. We do youth basketball, AAU and everything. But you're starting to see a lot of that. And we need to pay attention to this because I'm very concerned about it as a sports team owner. Do you think there's a regulatory fix in, additional, in addition to private business? Is there, is there a way that the government can get involved in this? Yeah, they need to put more money back into the school system Amen. so that they can bring physical education back in there. But it's, it's just not happening. So you're going to see these racial disparities that are going on. I was asking Ariel uh, earlier, did she run into that in Texas? And she said no. Right? No, go ahead. Yeah, we had, I've never even, I mean, we were talking about it up there. I never even thought about physical education not being in schools. And so I asked her, I was like, so they just go to class all day? <laughs> and she's like, well, most yeah. Of the, most of them did. When I was growing up, we had physical education every single day in the school, but it has really disappeared, especially in the urban school setting. What was the physical education like at, at, at the time at, at an elementary school level? Was it what you uh, consider to be high quality or entertaining? It or was high quality. I went to a large school system just outside of Chicago. So we ran track and we had swimming classes and we did a whole lot of things. But then I've gone back to visit it and it's gone. And it's all because of money. So this is a this is an access to sports for for everybody or for for children of color in particular. Yes, but, and I, I think we need to reexamine that and see how we can get physical education back into the school system, especially public school system. Private schools will always have it, but I think in you know public schools you've got to get it back in there. And and if it is coming back, would you like an aerial too? You, would you like to see this come back in the same, or would you like for physical education in schools to look different in addition to? being properly resourced. Uh, I, I'm not quite clear where you're going with this. <laughs> what do you mean? If you, could, if you could design physical education from scratch, if resources weren't an issue, but you wanted to make sure that it was something that appealed to children of all genders, what, what would you do? What would you, what would you program? If I were to program, I would first take the whole program. I would put nutrition in there to help the kids with that. And they, they can run track, they can play basketball. I mean, you can do everything. You don't have to change that much. You just need to bring it back into the schools. And it could be boys, girls. My son went to private school and they were both boys and girls in the same, on the same sports. My son didn't like it, but that's the way it was. <laughs> you think he learned something from it after the fact? Not Did to put he your learn? son on the spot. <laughs> no, he, he just got frustrated and he says, She's getting her hair braided at, you know, back at the soccer post, but you know, that's all that's I'm going on. I'm a phys ed teacher and would love to comment on that. Um, I think access to phys ed is about access to wellness. Yes. And that's what we need to do when we bring something that's been called physical education back. It's really got to be a wellness approach. And We've lost uh, some national momentum, and I agree with Sheila 100%. The resources have disappeared, and we scrape every year as a profession. Um, we've, we've started to look better internally as a profession as well, um, to look at the folks who are our educational leaders within the wellness space. We need to talk about all aspects of lifelong approaches to fitness, uh, wellness, mental and emotional, um, and that's key right now. The mental, emotional wellness in our kids is in trouble. And that has got to be owned by someone in the school system because that's the one place all kids have to go. And while we have them, we've got to take care of them. And the physical education and health and wellness programs have to do it and do it better, and they need help. Exactly, and I think there's just ways of doing this. There's nothing wrong with starting the school day. It could be yoga. It could be uh, just sitting there and meditating. But this is something that um, 
I've been talking with Dan Porterfield and the board. It, we, I'm hoping that the Aspen Institute really takes this whole health and mental health wellness program. We really want to study this and bring it to the forefront because this is where we're really falling apart. Yes, athleticism, all the fitness programs are great and I think they all help us. When you take sports out of the school system, this you're going to see a cognizant and mental decline and it's happening across the board. These kids need an outlet. They need somewhere where they can do mind, body, spirit, work it out on a soccer field, on a basketball court. You take it away, what else are they going to do? They're going to run the streets. They're going to get in trouble. We are underestimating the importance of sports. You know, and Title IX needs to play a stronger role in this. Yes, we're talking about Title IX. It's more than that. We, we've got some other issues that we have got to address. Title IX can take this on and we can broaden what does Title IX do? Where are we going to go with this? How can we really talk on these issues of mental health? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just not box Title IX, say it's just Title IX. It's more than that. Well, I'll let Ariel have the, the last word on that. Do you think that if Title IX were, were different, then, uh, <laughs> then the WNBA would be different? Do you think that a, a stronger Title IX would make professional sports for women stronger? Yes. I mean, in the short answer, I mean, they said everything that honestly needed to be said. Um, but like I said earlier, you hear us talking about the inequities that we have to deal with. One of the main things is surrounding travel, um, just because of how our season's, uh, season is. Um, so in, in a short answer, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's educating. I mean, the WNBA is so important, but they always, at the end of an NBA season, you know, we're fighting to get more media recognition. You know, and they're, they're constantly, you know, I brought it up earlier, John, don't get on me about this, but facilities. We have been able to correct our facilities here in Washington, D.C., but other teams are still struggling. Well, thank you very much. This has been really informative. I'm glad we got to have the conversation. All right, thank you. Thanks. Great.